<laughs> Hi, I'm David Cobb. And I'm Sean Bagshaw. And this is Wide Angle with Photo Cascadia. Welcome to episode two, and today we will be talking about photographing in the forest. If you're watching this from the, uh, the blog, then you're already a blog reader. But if you found us through YouTube, just want to let you know that Photo Cascadia is a photography team, and we have been curating and writing a blog for 11 years now. So if you head over to photocascadia.com, you can see all of our blog content. So it includes videos like this, but also written articles, uh, audio blogs, and video tutorials. So go check it out, photocascadia.com. I think I've seen you more this year than my wife. Uh, we've uh, had uh, the Photo Cascadia meetup. We went and shot snow scenes for a while, and then we just did a workshop, and then we're heading off to Mendocino now in California. So we've been busy together, I guess. So here we are again. Um, David, I have to say that you uh, are one of the best and most experienced forest photographers that I know. And forest photography is challenging for people. You know, there's a lot going on. Forests are busy and complex. They can make beautiful photos, but it can also be really challenging. So it's great to be able to have this conversation. And we've had this conversation many times over the years. We, we have. We have. Forest photography is really hard. It's, it's probably the toughest landscape photography you can do. And some of the things that I look for when I do forest photography, one, I walk up on a hill and I shoot down. And I do this because I like to leave out the sky. The sky have a, has a lot of visual weight and it's, uh, it's going to attract the eye really fast. So I try to leave out the sky. I want the eye to look at that forest uh, without being distracted. I look for what I call leaners. Those are trees that are leaning to the side a little bit. I look for snags. Um, a lot of forests have those. Sn snags are broken trees or old trees or old burned out trees. So I also look for gaps in the forest someplace. I, I call it corridors basically, but uh, I, I look for gaps in the forest if possible. Kind of what that all boils down to is that, yeah, forests can have just visual clutter and be really messy and complex. And so maybe the, the key is kind of what you were saying is you have to find the right angle or the right forest or the right perspective on the forest and uh, that's I, that's what I think is a lot of people just walk into any forest and then are immediately frustrated and that would be the same for anyone I mean um, if you're not in a situation where the forest has some sort of organization or has a vantage point that you can get to where you can see it from above or you can have some open space or you can have corridors or things like that, then yeah, it's just no matter what you do, it's, it's going to be really, really difficult. So number one tip maybe is, you know, find a forest where you have one of those options or more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And you know, I've photographed a lot of forests uh, around the States, whether it's the bayous in Louisiana or the hardwoods up in upstate New York, uh, the redwood forests, uh, there's just a lot of great forest settings, um, but you're right, there's a lot of clutter. And kind of to get rid of that clutter, I, I tend to go to the midsection of those forests. Uh, I like that midsection. Sometimes you get a lot of horizontals to break up the verticals. So anything to break up that, you know, toothpick line basically is is good. In the redwood forests, uh, there's a lot of rhododendrons. Um, there's that one classic shot with a rhododendron coming out of that old tree. Yep. And, uh, you know, it doesn't always bloom. So sometimes you might have 40 or 50 blooms on that rhododendron, uh, sometimes three or none. And, you know, if you can get it in a good bloom year, that's a great thing to have to break up the forest uh, just in a horizontal, something a little bit different. I mean, that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, it, kind of that, that middle story or the middle section, because uh, I know that particular scene, and below that is just a clutter of brambles and brush. And then above that, of course, you get some of the sky and the branches up high and the canopy get uh, much more you know, cluttery and complex. But there is that kind of middle section 
uh, where that rhododendron is growing and the trunks are straight and clean. And so looking in that, um, you know, above the, the clutter of the understory and below the clutter of the canopy is often where you can find some simplicity and some organization. Yeah, and those first few branches uh, of the trees are very often interesting. I mean, sometimes they have a little uh, warped branches with it, some Nike swoosh, or they might have moss growing on them. Uh, there's a lot of interest in those first few branches. So that's really the middle section that I look for. Uh, yeah, you're right. I get rid of the trunks. I get rid of the top of the trees. Um, I climb up and just look for that middle section. So a telephoto wor works uh I was just going to say, yeah, what kind in. of focal length? Yeah, sometimes I'm using, a, you know, in the forest, I'm, I tend to use a 24 to 70. Uh, I've got a Canon 24 to 70 2.8 2 lens and a Canon 70 to 200 lens that uh, I use. And also on top of that, it's really important to use a polarizer. You wouldn't think in a forest you need a polarizer, but out, well, especially out here in the Pacific Northwest, you you have to have a polarizer to cut down that glare. There's, there's salal out here. There's a lot of ferns and there's so much glare that comes off of that. Even on a cloudy day, there's a lot of glare and to help saturate the leaves of aspen to help saturate those greens. And it just helps with the color and helps with every clean everything up. Anytime you have a shiny surface uh, that's pointing up at the sky, you're going to get that sky reflected. And if it's an overcast sky, you're going to get white reflections if, on the leaves and if it's a blue sky, you're going to get blue reflections. And so parts of your green leaves are going to look blue. Polarizer, I agree. Really helpful. I also look for corridors. And this kind of terminology, I just kind of make up as I go on the fly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> corridors could be anything. There are man-made corridors, uh, a road um, or a two-track. You see those going through forests. The two track you see through Aspen Forest quite often. So that's something that will uh, have a leading line. And uh, a road is a perfect uh, corridor through the forest. Uh, sometimes it's a dirt road, sometimes it's a paved road. A trail is another man made corridor. Uh, I know out in Oregon, we've had that, we have that Boardman Forest. It's no longer there. It's now cattle and potatoes, I guess. But uh, for oh, the, the tree farm. The tree farm. It was a big attraction for a long, long time. And it had, you know, those man-made corridors because the trees were planted in rows kind of like corn. So it had a, a, a planting corridor, basically. Right. Uh, but other corridors that are there, there's a lot of natural corridors in a forest. You, and, and they're important because they allow the viewer to imagine walking into that forest, walking through the woods. It, it beckons the viewer forward and it helps the viewer to explore the forest a little bit more. Yeah, it allows you to see into it, uh, creates that dimension, the vanishing lines, and, and for simplicity too. That's always the problem in forests is that uh, everything's just so busy. There's so much visual information and an opening or a corridor like that allows there to be space with not a lot going on. So, you know, someplace a little more restful for the eye to go. And yeah. then it's kind of framed by all the, the busyness of the forest. And then, yeah, and that, that Boardman tree farm, yeah, it is a shame that that's gone now because it's a forest setting, but then you've got this kind of uh, human-made designed architecture to it as well, you know, with those trees just perfectly spaced in perfectly straight rows. And I always found that interesting because we expect kind of chaos and diversity in a forest setting. And then here's a forest setting where everything is just you know, lockstep in perfect lines and spacing. And it, it does an interesting thing to the brain, I think. Yeah, and they're all genetic clones too. So <laughs> they're yeah, so really every, lockstep together. Every tree's identical pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'll walk through a forest that is messy or cluttered and I'm searching for corridors and I just don't find them. But yeah, like what you said is that if you can find a path or an old road, those all leave corridors through the forest. Or if you can be in a forest and go to where a stream is, a stream leaves a natural corridor through the forest. And yeah, you have a great shot that uh, you took in Slovenia of a stream cutting through the forest. And that's just a, you know, amazing shot and a, just a wonderful corridor through there. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can talk about that one a little bit too. That's a beautiful forest, that particular beach forest in that part of Slovenia. But it's, it's, it's a difficult forest to shoot. But there's this great limestone canyon that just 
carved through the middle of that particular place. And uh, there's only a couple of spots that have bridges over that little canyon, the gorge. And if you can get on a bridge or just even on a, a bend in the creek so you can actually look down the, uh, the stream, then that's that natural quarter. And that one is great because it combines the forest, which kind of frames the canopy and the tree trunks, you know, frame the upper part of the image, but then you actually have some depth to that. So you've got the, the limestone canyon walls and then eventually the water down at the bottom, which is another bonus to that kind of quarter because then uh, a stream, the water is a reflective surface. So it kind of adds a highlight within that dark forest. You know, it's catching light from, from up above and just adds one more dimension, one more uh, element of depth. Yeah, yeah. That was, that's a great scene. I love that spot. Yeah, and, and the a place that I like too is in the Metal Valley because there's some uh, trails up there that create some natural corridors, well, not natural corridors, they're man-made, but uh, some wonderful corridors. And what I like to do is get out my telephoto lens again and compress those corridors. Uh, the trees have a lot of spacing into it, and if you can get out your telephoto and compress those trees, then it just makes that corridor more corridor-like, more dramatic, and it's almost a tunnel view in a way. Coming back to the idea of shooting longer focal lengths in a forest, a lot of times landscape photographers are out shooting really wide, you know, 16 millimeters or wider. Um, and that's kind of, we get in that mode as landscape photographers. But to remember that in a forest, a lot of times to use a longer focal length, so maybe, you know, 50, 70, 100, even 200 millimeters, depending on how much space you have in the forest, not only does it do, like you said, it kind of compresses the scene, makes the, mm -hmm. the forest, even, uh, you know, trees seem closer together or, um, you know, draws you into the depths of the forest, but also simplifies because with the telephoto, that's how you can cut out parts of the forest that, that are distracting. Exactly. And, you know, I, I rarely, if ever, use wide angle lenses in the forest, but you did in the Redwoods one year and you have got ferns down below uh, with a receding hill and it works. I mean, that's a, the kind of thing is always be looking for different opportunities and availability. So when you're in certain forests, uh, it can lend itself to shooting wide. And the redwoods are a great example of this because what I find the redwoods is they tend to be fairly clean a lot of the times. So you've got a clean understory. Uh, and in parts of the redwoods, if you can be on a hillside and then have an opening, kind of a clearing in the trees. So you do have space for a foreground and the trees are kind of the backdrop for that. Uh -huh. um, that's a great example. And so those ferns were such a strong foreground element and I wanted to get really close to them, make them big in the scene and then just have the redwood trees and kind of the, the slope going away as just being a backdrop. It's more like the ferns are maybe some foreground element, maybe like the mud tiles in Death Valley or a stream or waves at the ocean. And in that case, the trees, the redwood trees in the background are, are a background. They're like a mountain range out in the distance or a sea stack or something like that. Yeah, and you were able to capture some of the ground cover too. And one of my favorite places to go to capture ground cover is off in the Sawtooth Mountains. There's a lodgepole pine forest there and it's just fabulous for ground cover. It's filled with huckleberry. It's filled with all sorts of other plants and some willows and other things. And the, the riot of color that goes through there, the oranges, the yellows, the greens, the reds. And when you see ground cover like that, you just can't pass it up. Um, there's very often fog off the lake too, so that helps with the whole mystery of the thing. Ground cover is important. You know, we talked about that middle section, but when you have a clean forest with some just beautiful ground cover, take advantage of that too and get that lower part. And again, you know, if you can keep the sky out as much as possible. So in addition to sawtooth, where else have you found forests that have an interesting and photogenic ground cover? You know, the upstate New York, um, I don't know if it's ground cover as much, but there's, it's, it's a clean ground and a lot of the leaves were falling. So I guess the ground cover there would be all the leaves that were falling. It's just a blanket of yellow. So that, that has some nice ground cover too. Then in the, the bayous of Louisiana, it's not really ground cover per se, but right. you've got wonderful reflections of the cypress trees uh, in the lake. And then other places, it's just this algae that floats. So you have this almost fluorescent green water 
and uh, the mosses coming right into that fluorescent green. So that makes for interesting ground cover too. So I'm going to include some of those trees. The places where I find some of the best clean forests are either old growth forests, you know, they've been growing a long time. Yeah. And a lot of that shrubbery that grows up in the understory of forests that's really messy, you know, gets shaded out in old growth forests. And then you get the ferns or the moss or the kind of the clean carpet flooring. And then the other place I know is in managed forests. So, you know, like the Boardman tree farm we were talking about. And also a a lot of the forests in Europe, uh, you know, are not old growth. They're now managed kind of manicured forests and they can be a lot of really clean. I know a lot of the beach forests in Slovenia that we found. When I try to pick my trees, I look for trees with character. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tree in the redwoods that have, uh, that has two knot holes in it. And I've got a shot of that too. Uh, you know, the spotlighting helps, but it's just got two big holes in it. It's got a corridor it's got a two track which is actually the old highway going along the um, coastline no longer used it's now a trail but uh, it, it just makes for a wonderful corridor next to a tree with interesting character yeah. and it just happens to have a rhododendron next to it too so that helps so <laughs> uh, you know all of those factors go into a successful photo even finding small scenes on the forest floor you're a master of this and one of my favorite images of yours is you know that just iridescent aspen leaf on a I think it's a rock with lichen yeah it, it's it's again in the sawtooth uh, there was a stone with some just beautiful lichen on it all different colors uh, and there was an aspen leaf on it so uh, just photographing that scene looking down changing your perspective looking up uh, looking up at the tops of the trees I know you have a photo there that looks up uh, at the tops of the trees and just to change your perspective, look at the ground. It's a lot of little teeny things down there, some wonderful flowers, uh, leaf patterns. So I'm continually look, looking for the macro shot in the forest too. And in the fall, for me, it's mushrooms. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, mushrooms for me are the flowers of the fall. So I'm always looking at mushrooms, you know, looking for mushrooms. To go back to Slovenia, one thing that uh, is important with pretty much any type of photography is light and in Slovenia you got some wonderful light you got some great fog uh, you got some light rays tell me a little bit about that too there are photographers out there I know uh, several of them that have kind of made their entire careers their entire portfolios based around foggy forests it can just be beautiful but that edge of fog where you've got the fog which what it does is it well, it creates some mystery, creates some softness to the light, but it also can help obscure some of that busyness. Like if the background of the forest is really messy and busy, the fog helps smooth and simplify uh, that. So you're really only seeing what's closer to you and not what's uh, as far away. And then if you get light coming through the fog and you get rays of light and pools of light and light and shadow, kind of uh, alternating areas. It's just magical. Yeah, we had a fog bow and the light, great fog in the forest and foggy morning photographing a church. So you, you can't go wrong. If, if you see fog and you're near a forest, get out with your camera and go in the, go in the forest with your camera on a foggy day. What are your thoughts about um, the best, your favorite kind of light in a forest to photograph in? I like that soft light that's barely perceptible in differences. Maybe something that might be a half or one stop apart. It looks like it's a bright day in the forest, but it's really not. I, I enjoy backlighting a lot, especially in the fall. In the aspen forest, I'm always looking for backlighting. And in the redwood forest, when you get that backlighting, you get those wonderful sun stars behind the tree. Gosh, a few years ago, we were up on the coastal range of California shooting through the lupins and the old oak trees up there. And you're like sun star king. <laughs> bench, uh, uh, you get that Canon 16 to 35 lens out. I think that's what you're using, but man, yeah, that, we're just getting those sun stars crazy. It's a sunny day and you've got direct sun coming in. One of the ways that you can kind of give that some context is to include the sun in the image. And if the sun is only partly showing, it's you know, kind of being obscured by a branch or peeking out around the trunk of a tree and you stop down. So you use a small aperture, maybe F16 or even up to F22, then that will create that sun star. And sun stars are going to look different depending on the lens. And some lenses are just 
better for some stars than others. And so it's just one of those things you have to try with your gear and try it with different lenses and see how you like the Sunstar. And it just happens that if you have the, um, the Canon, uh, oh, 1635, sorry, F 2.8 version two lens, that that gives just the super clean, perfect Sunstar. And I just got the uh, Canon RF 15 to 35 uh, lens, new lens for me. And I wanted to test out the Sunstar on that, which I did this weekend at the coast when we were over there. And uh, it also has a super clean sun star. So that's a fun thing. If you're in the forest on a sunny day and you got that sunlight coming in as well, that's one more little element that you can add into your uh, forest photography. And um, on the topic of backlighting too, you mentioned that. Backlighting is one of the most challenging types of light to photograph, but it's also one of the most dramatic. And in the forest with leaves, whether it's fall leaves or spring leaves, anything where the light can transmit through it, uh, and you put the, the light source behind the leaves, now they look like they're kind of lit from within with their own you know, power source. And that really creates that, that wonderful luminescent kind of light in the depths sort of look. Yeah, and that's also a good time to get up a little bit higher, put on your lens hood and point down just a touch because lens, lens flare can be a bear at times. So when you're going for that backlighting, so you have to be aware of that. You have to watch that and then just work around it. But yeah, you can get some great shots with that Absolutely. Uh, backlighting. And one final point I want to make yeah. is I know a lot of people in landscape photography don't like to photograph people. Um, but mm. uh, when you're in a forest, to put a person in there, uh, mm -hmm. the redwood forest, they're wearing red, uh, someone wearing a cooler color in the Aspen forest. But if you're putting in a person in there just to show a sense of scale, uh, that seems to help. Um, getting an animal in there is fine too, if it's a deer or an elk or whatever. But uh, any of that, just to have a little bit of expression, um, an anchor point uh, and juxtaposition, but also to, to give some scale. Absolutely. Well, this has been uh, fun as it always is chatting photography and especially forest photography with you, David. Thanks for having the chat. You're welcome. And I also, I'm going to plug this guy because he's oh, yeah. someone that influenced me, uh, Mr. Sexton here. And there you go. Yeah, the, got the glare off here. Yep. Um, but this guy is just an amazing photographer of trees. So John he, Sexton. Yeah, he, he is an influence of mine. That book was called Listen to the Trees. And just to look at that book to get an idea of kind of how he, he shoots, um, I think will be of help. I never met Absolutely. the guy, but I like his book. Yeah, and I think any time, you know, any type of photography, to take a look at what, uh, you know, experienced photographers have done, what people whose photography you like, how they handle different situations and forest photography. Yeah, John Sexton's great. I know William Neal has wonderful uh, forest photography and, and many, many others. You know, we could go yeah. on and on. So search them out and study their work. Yeah, I agree. Well, All nice right. chatting. Very nice chat, always. It's been fun. Hopefully some of this information and these ideas is helpful for some other folks as well. But even if it's not, it's fun to chat with you. <laughs> <laughs> as always and i'll probably see you again in a few weeks so take care sean yeah take care and i'll just finish up by saying uh thanks for joining us and listening in and again if you're finding us on youtube remember to come over to photocascadia.com to the blog there and uh, check it out and in addition to that you can also keep up with all of photo cascadia's latest news adventures workshops and whatever else we have going on but I guess for now, that's uh, this episode of The Wide Angle with Photo Cascadia. Talk to you later. Take care, David. See you, John.